Hello friends. Okay, so today's video is all about mental hunger and identifying the signs that your brain is sending to you that say, I'm hungry, I need more food. Now, this is going to be a reflection on a more personal level of me sharing with you a list, actually it's quite a long list as well, I've made a list, um, of a variety of ways. I was going to say all of the ways, but there's probably a few others, but lots of different ways in which my mental hunger came to the surface and things that I identified in recovery as signs and symptoms of my body needing more food. And I wanted to share this because it is so important in recovery to identify hunger and critically mental hunger. Physical hunger, of course, every single dot of hunger in recovery needs to be honoured and validated through your actions. However, mental hunger tends to be the more reliable hunger signal in recovery. Hear me, I said tens, so not everyone, but for a lot of people in recovery, mental hunger is a more reliable source of hunger. It's that background thing, it's where your body goes, well, they're not really paying attention and we're in an energy deprived state, but I'm just gonna make sure they're aware all of the time that food is really important. So I'm just gonna have them thinking about food all of the time. And I wanted to share with you a list of things that I identified in recovery as signs that I needed to eat. They were either signs of an immediate kind of up, oh, right, no, I'm hungry right now, or they were signs that were more just a indicator that my body was in an energy deficit and therefore needed more food. So I really wanted to share it with you because it's so important to be able to explore how your body is sending you signals and to get curious about the different ways in which your hunger comes to the surface. And I wanted to share these because I wonder if, you know, some of them, they may overlap with other people's experiences. Some of them might open doors of curiosity to be like, oh, maybe that's hunger for me as well then. As I say, not everyone's experience is exactly the same. I'm not reading this list and saying that every time you do these things, you must be. But I am reading this list as these were some of mine and I hope that there is some benefit from me sharing this. So without further ado, I am going to crack on with the list. There are quite a few. So number one, being food centric. And I've written in brackets the cinema because I think the cinema is a really good example of what I mean by this. When I was in an energy deprived state, going to the cinema centered around the food. It's centred around the pick and mix and the popcorn and the this and the hot dogs and the that. It's centred around it. Now, now that I am no longer in an energy deficit, I like the snacks at the cinema. I mean, popcorn, pick and mix, what's not to like? But does the experience centre around it? No. Like I, I'm going to the cinema for the film. I want to go and watch the film. And that's where the majority of my attention is. It just so happens that you go there and they also have lots of great snacks so you can buy them. Whereas when I was in an energy deficit, I was totally food centric. My brain basically was going, food is scarce. We need more of it. It is the most important thing. You need to be thinking about and finding and seeking food at all opportunities and just, just food, 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 food. So I was entirely food centric. Number two, asking what others have eaten. So, I mean, I think that's a, a fairly self-explanatory one. I would do this quite a lot. Just curiosity about what other people had eaten, what they were going to eat, what they picked if they went out. You know, like someone might be, I don't know, talking about something they'd done, being like, oh, I went on a date with this person or oh, I went out with some friends. And my question would be like, oh, what did you order? I wouldn't be like, oh, what was the conversation or what was the, it would be, what did you order? Did you get dessert? Like, again, it's that a food centric brain. Number three, floating around the kitchen. So I suppose this is that physical food centricness where I would spend quite a lot of time kind of just floating around the kitchen, kind of maybe opening some cupboards and closing them. And if someone had asked me like, oh, you're hungry, I'd have been like, oh, not really, no, no. But actually, this was an example of something where I had to learn wait for this is hunger like my body is hungry right now the me that feels naturally pulled towards the kitchen to sort of just gravitate around and look at things that is hunger and even if i'm not even if i'm not experiencing it in that exact moment as hunger that was an example of something that i had to go oh i'm hungry and so then obviously that would then be honored 
with eating. Number four, couldn't concentrate on things other than food. So this is again a classic, classic symptom of a brain that is in an energy deficit. It's really hard when you're in an energy deprived state to think of things other than food. Food is sort of the centre of the world, it's up on that pedestal and you can find yourself daydreaming off just thinking about it or you're in a conversation but actually you're just paying attention to what the person has on their plate or you're trying to do something but actually you're just sort of staring over something's shoulder and being like oh what's that going on over there like oh they've got a new restaurant there or, or you're trying to I don't know you're trying to find something on the internet but you somehow find yourself looking at that new place that's opening up around the corner and looking at when they're opening and what they serve and da -da. generally just being hyper focused on food and finding it really hard to, to concentrate on other stuff I know in my recovery if I found myself struggling to concentrate on a film I was watching or a book I was looking at or whatever, I'd kind of check in and be like, am I hungry right now? And one of the mantras that is so useful in in recovery is, if in doubt, eat. So if I asked myself that question and I checked in and was like, am I hungry? And there was kind of a, mm, mm, I'd go and get something. Number five, taking photos of foods lots. Um, yeah, I don't don't need to describe more of that. That for me, absolutely classic when I had that desire to either take lots of photos of food or look at photographs of food, that is hunger. It's sort of, again, it's food being up on that pedestal and just being like, oh, wow, look at it. Am I saying that everyone who ever takes a photograph of food is in an energy deprived state and is hungry? No, I'm not. But I do think that when it comes to recovery, one of the trends that I noticed that clearly proved that it was hunger was that as I moved out of energy deficit my desire to look at pictures of food my desire to take photographs of food really seriously dissipated the next one is watching food content and challenges so I'm talking about your food related tv shows I'm talking about your 10,000 calorie challenge videos the I'm going to eat all the green foods in a day kind of video or the I'm going to eat like old Mother Hubbard for a day. I don't know, all that stuff. Having a real drive to watch that kind of content, to watch food centered content, it's a sign of hunger. And I think for me, it was really important that I clocked this and acknowledged it and then got up and went and got food. And for me, this really was a critical, critical sign of my brain being hungry. And I think it's, again, it's one of those things I know it is for an absolute fact now because I don't have any interest in watching cooking shows any longer. I didn't have interest in watching cooking shows before my eating disorder. And then suddenly through my eating disorder, I developed an intense interest in all cooking related programs, in food related videos, in 10,000 calorie challenges, all that kind of stuff. I really developed a, an intense interest in it. And that was a direct response to being in an energy deficit and my brain being food focused and food orientated because it believed that food was scarce and because it was hungry. And that's what hungry brains do. They think about food. So the next one is actually watching recovery content, which was which was really important for me to acknowledge as a hunger signal in recovery, because I would watch lots of videos, Tabitha Vra, um, and I had to really clock that whilst that's great, it's fine. There's nothing wrong in watching recovery content. I also had to acknowledge that the driver behind watching that was hunger whether it was seeking permission to honour that hunger, whether it was tackling a fear that I was dealing with to overcome and then to, whatever it was, the underlying driver to watch that content was hunger. And so treating my desire to watch recovery stuff as a hunger signal was really important. And that often meant going and making sure that if I was going to be watching videos, if I noticed oh, I really want to sit down and watch a video, I would stick it on and be making myself food whilst it was playing in the background and I'd be eating whilst it was playing in the background. But yeah, both of those things, watching general food related content and watching recovery content, I'd really recommend you get curious about the driver behind that and the role that your hunger is playing in that. 
The next one is looking at menus for places. I don't really need to delve into this too much. That is just absolutely classic hunger. Uh, am I saying that everyone in the world who looks at menus places is hungry and has an eating disorder and has is in an energy deficit? No, but am I saying that people who are in an energy deficit and have eating disorders do a lot of looking at menus? Yes, and am I saying that actually you kind of need to check in with that behaviour and go, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And so at the time when I started to be like, yeah, actually, there is one disorder in this because this is me trying to look and to control things and to see what there is. But also there is hunger driving it. What I would do is slam the lid of what it is or put my phone away and then go and get food right then and there. And that didn't matter if I was going out for a meal in half an hour's time acknowledge the fact that right in that moment I was hungry and actually what needed to happen is that I go right then right there and get food. Number nine. Oh, this is an interesting one. Worrying lots about future food plans. So definitely this for me was something I kind of had to clock was a symptom of hunger in the now and I think one of the ways I kind of started to become aware of this is that in recovery, recovery action leads to more recovery action, just in the same way that restriction leads to more restriction. And what this meant is I noticed that actually if I attacked the day, if I in the now did everything that I could to challenge my eating sort of the most, to honour all of my hunger, to eat without restriction, to eat as much as possible, if I did all of that in the now, Actually, what happened is if there was something going on later that day or that weekend or whenever it was, I actually was setting myself up to do better in that, which is completely counter counter to what your eating sort of suggests, because the eating sort of suggestion is, no, no, we have to compensate here so that it's OK there. But we know we know what that leads to. We know what compensation actually leads to. We know what engaging the eating sort of actually leads to. But the truth of it is, the you who puts your foot really firmly on the accelerator and brings your attention into the now and says, no, I need to be honouring all of my hunger right now. You are setting yourself up to do better later and to worry about it less. Because at the end of the day, there are two things that are driving that worry about the future. One, thinking about food, hunger, hungry brain. Two, Worrying about it, thinking about what you're going to have, restriction, that's eating disorder. And for both of those things, the solution is eating. So the best thing that you can do for all reasons in that situation is acknowledge, right, later, yeah, I'm going out later. And maybe clock the thoughts that are coming up if there's like, oh, you're going to have pudding later. Just be like, I'm doing everything later. I'm going out, I'm going to order exactly what I want. I'm going to get everything. I'm, of course I'm getting pudding. Like really hit it home and then bring yourself back into the now and go, and I'm worrying about it, so I'm hungry right now, so I need to do the action and the eating right now. Um, next one, clocking bars, restaurants, cafes, bakeries everywhere. Oh gosh, yes, I remember this was exhausting. I feel like I just notice food stuff everywhere. You know, wherever I'd go, I'd be maybe walking down the street and talking to a friend, but I'd be like back of my mind or in front of my mind noticing oh look there's Greg's and what are they selling Greg's and oh look there's that and oh that's a chip shop and oh that's a restaurant I wonder what they sell and all that just constantly it's like my brain was in high alert scanning mode for where is the food of this environment which at the end of the day if you're in an energy deficit that's really clever really clever it makes total sense um, but I do definitely remember this and I also remember having to acknowledge that that was hunger that that was a sign that I was hungry. And actually, rather than just noticing like, oh, look at the Greggs, I actually needed to go into the Greggs and buy the thing and walk down the street and eat it and then repeat that over and over and over again. Next, we've got enjoying talking about food. Yeah, so I think this kind of almost links a little bit back to can't concentrate on other things. But just that generally... I would quite like it when conversation gravitated round to food or I might find myself struggling to concentrate on conversations. But then if they came round to food, I was like, ping, ping, I'm here, ready, what's the conversation? So I think that was definitely something I had to acknowledge was a hunger signal. Number 12, I don't know if I've been numbering them. Oh, well, number 12 is overthinking everything. Now, this is one that I don't know how many people will relate to this. But I know that personally, something I had to acknowledge as a hunger signal for me in recovery was this propensity to overthink 
everything, to really seriously get sucked into rumination. And it wasn't necessarily about food stuff. It was kind of could be about anything and everything. It could just be about worries about the future, worries about myself and my life and worries about family and worries about this. It could just be thinking about past things that happen and regrets and anything, but just overthinking things intensely. I started to notice and recognise that that was, for me, a symptom that I needed to go and eat something. And actually what I almost always found, I say almost always, but actually I kind of want to say always, found was that when I was in that state and I went and I ate, I'd find that not that the worry would just disappear magically. Sometimes, sometimes it actually would. Sometimes I'd go from being so intensely worried and eating, I'd be like, that's not a worry. But often what would happen is it would go from being this overwhelming, intense thing that was going round and round and round and round to just being like, okay, I can acknowledge that. I can rationalise that. I can see that. Um, and so I think for me, it was really important to notice that overthinking, that rumination and go, right, that's hunger. Okay, I need to go and eat something. Next one is telling someone everything that I've had for the day. Yeah, I feel like I have no idea how many times my mum, my sister, Andrew heard spiels of what I had eaten so far in that day. And one, meticulously being able to remember everything you had in a day, that is mental hunger. That is food related thinking. That's a hungry brain thing. But also the driver behind that is seeking permission to do more eating. You know, I mean, I, I know it definitely was for me. I would kind of find myself going, well, I've had this and I've had this and I've had this and I've had this and then I had that. And really what was driving it was a hungry brain and seeking permission to eat more. And I think I had to acknowledge and learn to kind of catch myself, catch the desire to say that and go, ah, I know what this is. This is hunger. And this is seeking permission to validate that hunger and honour that hunger, right? Bypass that whole ring roll. Let's just get straight to the eating. Oh, the next one is asking questions to seek permission, which I think I've kind of just covered in that explanation. Next one is always clocking conversations about food. Oh, okay. So this is, I suppose, is a little bit like when I said that I would um, enjoy or encourage talking about food. This is the, you know, you might be out somewhere, but it's like your brain notices and scans the environment and goes, oh, that's a food related conversation and just zooms in on it. And when we look at the brain and how it processes information, you know, one of the things that your brain does that brains do is scan all of the information that is coming in all the time, which is a huge amount of information. And it filters it. It filters it to what it thinks is important. And we have this system in our brain, this filter called the reticular activating system. And one of the things that it does is based on what we have taught our brain through our actions and through our attention is important, it, it flags up that information. So a really, really good example of your reticular activating system working is when someone in a room, you could be in a room of loads of people and someone says your name. Now, they might be referring to you or they might not be, but you hear your name. And there's all those conversations going on, all that noise that you aren't paying attention to, but suddenly that name, pop, you, 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 you hone in on it. When we take that concept of that filtering system, which is really incredible, and we put it into recovery, in terms of what we have taught our brain is important, the restriction of food and compulsive movement absolutely falls into that category. So if that table over is having a conversation, either directly about the food they're ordering, or maybe they're referring to restriction or restrictive behaviours or they're talking about exercise or compulsive movement whatever it might be your brain is clocking that it's clocking it and it's going important 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 and that can mean that in an environment in any situation you feel like one you're always just zooming in on those conversations and that can also make you feel like everyone is always talking about it now that isn't to say that there isn't a lot of that kind of conversation going on I'm not denying that but when you have a brain that is filtering your environment and flagging up that information all the time, it can start to make you think and feel like it's happening everywhere because your brain is filtering the environment accordingly. However, in recovery, your opposite action taking, your neural rewiring work shifts that. It retrains your brain's filtering systems. And so actually what happens is 
you don't filter that information as much. You start to be able to naturally and authentically pay more attention to the conversation. And those conversations that are going on in the background, your brain's just like, oh, that's irrelevant information. Look at this conversation here. This is important because we like our friend. We pay attention to our friend. And that isn't something that's forced. It's an amazing thing that happens naturally as a response to you nutritionally rehabilitating and neurally rewiring. It's a wonderful, wonderful shift. So next on the list, I'm aware this video is quite long, so I'll try and chivvy on through. Um, making recovery food plans again and again and again. Absolutely, this is 100% classic hungry brain. And it's also often indicative of inadequate action taking on a recovery front. When I clocked myself making plans for recovery, I had to acknowledge that this was a hungry brain and that this was a me who was trying to find a way to navigate the doing and bypass the fear and bypass the chaos and the messiness and the resistance. And I kind of had to accept one, hungry brain needs to eat. Two, there isn't a plan that is going to, that's going to get rid of the fear, the doubt, the chaos of recovery. There isn't a plan. There is no plan that your eating disorder is going to approve of. And so I just had to put the pen down, go to the kitchen and do the eating um, and keep it quite simple. And so I, I used noticing that urge to make a plan for recovery as a clear indicator that one, I was hungry, but also two, there was probably not enough rebellious action taking going on. And I probably needed to put my foot back on that accelerator and just keep it simple. Remember, at its heart, recovery is honouring all of your hunger. So unrestricted eating and doing the opposite of what the eating soul wants you to do. You can just keep those two core commitments. That's it, that's all you need. In every single now, if you do those two things, you will get recovered. So I think there was value of clocking that as a hunger signal and then bringing it back to the simplicity and being like, right, take action right now. Next one is noticing food packaging everywhere. Okay, so this is quite similar to the noticing restaurants. It would just be that I would clock it could be packaging like in supermarkets. I might be like, oh, that's pretty, oh, that's this. I'd just be really interested in the packaging and what it looks like. But also noticing like litter, what was in bins, like just noticing food stuff all over the place. Um, and that again, classic hungry symptom. Next on the list is wanting to feed other people. And this is definitely something that I had to clock as a sign that I needed to go and eat. You know, it could be that I was wanting to bake and I was wanting to have some kind of event that I could bake for or it could have been that I was um, wanting, I don't know, someone had said they wanted something and I was like, oh, I'll make that for you or I was just generally kind of ready at any opportunity to jump in and make food for people or do things and that was something where I had to be like, oh, okay, that's because I am hungry and yeah, I can I can bake some cupcakes for my sister if she wants some cupcakes but I also need to be baking them and I need to make lots of them so that I can have lots of them too. Next on the list is feeling sad when I've just finished a meal. Yeah, this is, is a interesting one and it's literally exactly what it says on the tin. I have just noticed that I would get to the end of a meal or get to the end of something I was eating and just have like this kind of semi, I don't know, maybe sad isn't quite the word, but just this kind of like, oh, okay. And there'd be this kind of just wistfulness maybe. And then maybe followed by that, I'd be thinking about when the next time was going to. And I had to acknowledge that the thing driving that was hunger and restriction. Restriction of, well, no, now you've finished and that's what you're getting and that's what it is. That restrictive sort of full stop eating, which can absolutely mean that your hungry body goes, oh, OK, well, now we just wait until the next time when food's available. And I had to, in recovery, clock this and notice it and keep eating basically is the simplest answer to that. The next one is going to sleep thinking about breakfast. Yep, that's hunger. And what I would do is clock it, get up, go get food right then and there. And if it was, I was lying in bed and I was really thinking about, oh, I'm gonna have that mother's cereal, I'm gonna have this, that's what I'm gonna have. Blah, blah, blah. I would literally go and get those things right then and there. And when my eating sort of jumped in like, oh, but now what are you gonna do tomorrow? I'd be like, well, I'm going to have breakfast tomorrow and eat without restriction and do the opposite of what you suggest because I'm in recovery. And that's what you do in recovery. Next one is thinking about thinking about food. So this was a weird one where I'd often notice this if I had sat down and I'd eaten, maybe I'd eaten lots, like, and not just eating sort of version, but maybe I had genuinely eaten a lot of food. 
and I was noticing that I was still sort of thinking about food or I was thinking about thinking about food and it would be this kind of like I don't know almost maze of thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about food and am I really thinking about it am I just thinking about thinking about it and am I thinking about thinking about things and I just have to basically be like right stop this get up and go and get food um, next one is daydreaming about food. That's really obvious. I feel like that's a pretty bog standard mental hunger symptom. Uh, next one is feeling an odd comfort in being in a supermarket. Yes, this was strange. Like, strange in that me who, before my eating disorder, I mean, I liked supermarkets. Did I like supermarkets? I mean, I didn't hate supermarkets, but I wasn't interested in going to them. You know, if there was an option not to, if there was the option that someone else would go to the shops and do the food shop, that was better. Um, and, and would I have seen it as like a fun thing to go and do? No, definitely not. Yet in an energy deprived state, supermarkets, they kind of became interesting. And as I've written here, that kind of odd sense of comfort, I just sort of wander around and just feel somewhat at peace and like purposeful. I had to acknowledge that that again was a symptom of my brain being in an energy deprived state and my brain being hungry and I had to action the opposite, which meant going and getting food. Next one is thinking about food, eating and stuff during physical intimacy. Yes, that is definitely something I had to acknowledge was again, a hunger signal in the now, but also an indicator that I was in an energy deprived state that even in those moments where realistically food and, and things should, shouldn't be on your mind, like, you know, there's a lot of other things you can be thinking about at those moments. Um, it was. It was still there. It was like it was the numero uno theme of my entire life. And that wasn't because my brain was broken or I was addicted to food or this. It was simply because I was hungry and I needed to eat more. Clocking all the food in movies or TV shows. Some of these overlap slightly, but this would be just watching films, watching programs and really noticing what people were eating on it. Again, it's very blatant food-centric thinking. It's very blatant mental hunger. And I just had to clock again. Right, I'm hungry, go and eat. Next is constantly low-level hangry. I mean, I don't need to describe this one too much, but that was absolutely an indicator that I was hungry. Um, and again, I'd have to notice if I was starting to be snappy, snarky, um, and I'd just have to go and eat, basically. Um, next one is disproportionate reactions to little things. I think this kind of links in with the overthinking things with the low level being hungry but yeah noticing that if I had a disproportionate reaction to something whether I was disproportionately upset to something or whether I was disproportionately angry about something often I'd have to kind of check in and be like am I hungry right now and again if in doubt I'd eat next one is worrying about how much I had eaten again that sort of overlaps a bit with the telling people everything that I'd had it's that same process of one food related thinking and two that judgment that seeking of permission that seeking to validate more eating worrying about feeling full this is something i'd like to do another video on actually because i think the more i delve into it the more i realize that fear of fullness is a distinct component of a food scarcity mindset but definitely worrying about feeling full whether it was feeling full in the now or feeling too full to have something and enjoy it later i had to recognize that that was actually a hunger signal and it was also a fear that I needed to press into in order to rewire and then finally pursuing jobs roles and things that are food orientated okay yeah so I suppose that was where one example is me who was looking into being a dietitian now I am so grateful that I did not pursue that because I can't think of anything worse well but that's a classic example of pursuing um, a job or something that was related to food. And another thing I did was like a chalet cookery course because I was really interested in going out and doing a chalet season and doing all the cookery and everything like that because I was obsessed with looking at recipe books and doing all that. Looking, at... And honestly, now I can't think of anything worse. One, because I'm a terrible cook. I really am absolutely awful. But also because there are so many other things. If I was to go out and do some kind of season like that, there are so many other things that I would prefer to do. Anyway, that is my list. I hope that this video has been useful. I hope that it has been insightful. I hope that if anything has been insightful, you go away from here and get curious about 
how that hunger might be showing up for you and also get curious about other ways in which your hungry brain is coming to the surface. So on that note, I hope that you will have a wonderful day wherever you are and I look forward to speaking with you again soon.